O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So today my goal is to accomplish three things, and uh, you'll have to be the judge as to how successful I am by the time we finish. But my goal is to give you a little bit of biblical background, set the biblical context for what is happening in the world today, and in particular in the Middle East. Then I'm going to give you some of the secular history, because God is the Lord of history, and he works out his purposes in history, even what we call secular history. And then finally, I want to ask the question, what should our response be as Christian people? And not as Americans, because first and foremost, if we're the followers of Jesus Christ, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so what should our response be to what's taking place in the Middle East today as Christians, remembering that Jesus Christ died for all? And so those are the things that I hope to accomplish in the time that we have this morning. So uh, it's going to be somewhat rapid fire, and I apologize for that. But as I said, hopefully by the end, you'll come away with perhaps just a little better understanding of the complexity of the situation in the Middle East and why it is that we need to be praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, if you've seen any of the Star Wars movies... Uh, you know that they all begin in precisely the same way. With the words, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And what I want to suggest to you is that the story of what is happening in the Middle East, the story of what is happening in the land of promise or in Israel, the story of the Jewish people in that part of the world is a story that began a long time ago. And in a culture, in a world, in a society that is as different from our own, as foreign from our own, as a galaxy far, far away. And that's one of the reasons why it becomes very difficult for us as Americans uh, to understand the situation. So it's a long story. It's also a complicated story. And the story begins in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, with the calling of this man, Abram. You can find it in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. So that is the calling of Abraham who is the father, incidentally, of both the Jewish and the Arab peoples. So this is the beginning of the story. It's a story that begins 4,000 years ago. That is a long time past. We as Americans have difficulty remembering events that took place 260 years ago or so. I mean, if I were to ask you, how many of you can name the first five presidents of the United States of America? How many of you would pass the test? Some of you might, but I rather suspect that most of you would probably fail. You might be able to name the first, the second, maybe even the third, but you would have difficulty with the fourth and the fifth. That would be my wager. Well, this is a story that begins much further back than that, with this promise that God makes to Abraham. And for our purposes this morning, it's a promise that has two important components. First, God promises to take Abram and make him a great nation. He says that your descendants will be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand 
on the beach. Now, you understand that that was an extraordinary promise to make to Abram, in part because we're told in the Old Testament that his wife was well beyond childbearing age. I think that's one of the most dismal descriptions of a woman anywhere in scripture or in literature. She's simply described, that's how Sarah is described as a woman who's well beyond childbearing age. Isn't that sad? The description of Abram's even worse. We're told he was as good as dead. <laughs> but nevertheless, God makes a promise to this one that he will have an heir. Regardless of how it may look from a human perspective, he is going to have an heir. He is going to make Abram a great nation. That's the first part of the promise. second part of the promise is that he is going to give him a land of his own, a land that is to be his possession. And basically, the story of the Old Testament is the unfolding of God's purposes in history through Abram and his descendants. It is the story of God fulfilling that promise that is made in Genesis chapter 12. The whole history of the Old Testament, finding its ultimate fulfillment, I might say, in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you know the story of the Old Testament. We don't have time to go through all of it. Just to highlight a few points, Abram did indeed, in spite of the bleakest of circumstances, have a son. He had Isaac, who is described as the child of the promise, Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And from Jacob, who had 13 children, 12 sons, from his sons and his descendants will come the 12 tribes of Israel. So what you start off with in fulfillment of God's promises is a man and then a family and then a people and ultimately, as we are going to see, a nation, a great nation. Now, Jacob was taken to this same land that his father Abraham and Isaac had been taken to. But you know that Jacob did not stay there in this land, that ultimately he would end up in Egypt. A famine blighted the land at that time, and so Jacob and his family ultimately went to Egypt. That's a whole other story, the story of Joseph and so forth. But that's where Jacob dies. He dies in that land, and his family remains there in Egypt. They're hardworking, they're industrious, they're prolific, they're fruitful, they multiply. And eventually, because they are becoming so populous, they become a threat, we're told, to the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians began to abuse them, persecute them, and ultimately enslave them. And the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob become slaves of the Egyptians for over 430 years. You know the story. They're forced to make bricks without straw. They are aliens living in a foreign land at this point. But God remembers his promise. This is important. God had made a promise to Abram, and it wasn't contingent upon anything that Abram had done. It was a matter of God's sheer grace. And God remembers the problem that he, the promise that he had made to Abram, and he determines to deliver his people and take them back to their promised land. And so he raises up a champion in the person of Moses. Moses goes and confronts Pharaoh and demands that the people be liberated. Pharaoh, of course, is refusing to relent, and so God brings a series of plagues upon the Egyptians until finally he gives in, and then God leads his people out by signs and wonders and the power of his outstretched arm through the Red Sea into the wilderness where they wander for 40 years until ultimately they are a people who are prepared to come back home and take possession of the land that had been promised to their forefathers centuries before. And that is the story, as you know, of the conquest. Joshua goes in, and they drive the native peoples out, and they take possession of the land. And while they're in this land, as they had been in Egypt, they are very industrious, they are very hardworking, uh, they grow in stature and importance until they reach what many people consider to be the zenith of their history, the pinnacle of their time. And this is when the nation comes under the reign of King David. Now, that's important because you need to understand that many Jews, even today, and certainly the Jews in Jesus' day, regarded this as the high point of their history. The Davidic dynasty. 
In fact, in Jesus' day, they were always looking for a Messiah, you will recall, to come and drive out the Romans and restore the Davidic dynasty. That's what they were looking for, to return to the glory days of Israel. This was when Israel was great among the nations, the princes of the earth. So that's the high point of their history. But it's a short-lived high point. David, of course, is a man after God's own heart, but David doesn't live forever. He dies. His son Solomon comes to the throne. Solomon is not as great as his father, but he is definitely a wise man, wisest of all the men on the face of the earth at the time, a good leader in some respects, but he does not pass his wisdom on to his son. And his son heavily taxes the people, Rehoboam, and as the result of this, they feel oppressed they can't support the king, and so a civil war erupts in this nation. God's chosen people, these people who have possessed this land and have become great in the land, but they are now fighting with each other, and the result is a divided kingdom. Of the 12 tribes, 10 will break away, and they will retain the name Israel, which was the name that God gave to Jacob. They will retain the name Israel, and they'll become the northern kingdom. They'll control the northern part of this land that had been given to Abraham and his descendants. Two tribes will remain faithful to Rehoboam in the south, and they will become known as the nation of Judah. Incidentally, that's where the name Jew comes from. All right? It's later on in history, but it's named for the people of Judah, the tribe of Judah, Jew. So those two tribes will remain loyal to Rehoboam in the south. Now, what happens to those ten tribes in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel, this divided kingdom? They're all Abraham's descendants, and they're all living in the land that God had given to Abraham and his descendants, but they are now divided. The ten tribes in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel, is going to fall prey to many of the pagan practices all around them. Uh, they're dealing with all kinds of secularism and peer pressure and pagan practices that are everywhere. And the consequence of that is that they come under the judgment of God. And we're told that the Assyrian Empire comes in. This is now, we're at the point, not only biblical history, but we're also talking about secular history. Much of this is recorded in ancient documents. The Assyrians come in and the Assyrians attack and destroy the northern kingdom. And what they do to those ten tribes is they begin to deport them. Now that's what they did in the ancient world. If you were an empire and you came in and you conquered a people, the one thing that you did not do is allow them to remain in the land where they can continue to be a problem for you. And so what you do is you deport them and begin to assimilate them into your own culture. Now, the southern kingdom continues to prosper for about another 150 years or so. But eventually, what had happened to those northern tribes happens to the southern kingdom, the two tribes in the south. That is to say, they begin to capitulate to the pagan practices all around them, and we're told that God brought judgment on them as well. And the result was that the Babylonians this time, not the Assyrians, but the Babylonians come in and they destroy the southern kingdom and do exactly what the Assyrians do. That is to say, they begin to deport the people off to Babylon. You know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the story of Daniel and the lion's den. All of that is part of this history. So Israel falls to the Assyrians in 721 B.C. Judah falls to the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar in 588 B.C. And the people are deported. Now, there does come a point where the Persian king Artaxerxes allows some of the people from the former kingdom of Judah to return to Jerusalem to their homeland, and begin to rebuild the city and rebuild the walls. That's the story of Nehemiah. But for all intents and purposes, this is the beginning of what we call the great Jewish diaspora. The Jewish people are being driven out of their land. They are being deported. Their numbers are diminishing. 
Now, that's not to say that people don't remain in the land. It's impossible to deport an entire population. It was certainly impossible to do that in the ancient world. But the point is this. Israel, as a nation state, at this point, ceases to exist. It's going to cease to exist as a nation state. The beginning of the Jewish diaspora. Now, over the succeeding centuries, this is going to become contested territory. In large measure because this is one of the most strategic locations on the globe. Certainly in the ancient world, it was a strategic location in terms of trade going north to south, trade going east to west. This is the Fertile Crescent. This is a very important part of the world. It's still important today. That's why it's front page news. This is why it's the headlines. It's because this is still a strategic location in the world today as it was then. And so successive generations are going to fight over this area. One empire after another is going to come in and conquer and be conquered. The Persians who were controlling this land will eventually be conquered by the Macedonians, that Greek, Greek empire under the command of Alexander the Great. But then Alexander the Great will die, and his kingdom, his empire, will be divided. And this will give rise to the Seleucid Empire. And the Seleucids will be there reigning over this part of the world. Now, there are Jews living in the land, the descendants of Abraham, but again, they are vassals, you understand. They do not have any kind of sovereignty whatsoever. They are not determining their own fate. They are under the thumb of oppressive nations. After the Seleucids, we'll have the Hasmonean dynasty. They are really a semi-independent dynasty. They are a people who really work under the authority of the Seleucids, but they try to maintain peace in the empire. This is the dynasty that will ultimately give rise to the Herods, King Herod, Herod the Great and Herod and his sons. And then, of course, by the time that Jesus appears on the scene, it's the Roman Empire that arrives in this region and controls it, conquers it around the year 63 B.C. Now, as I said, there were still Jews living in the land. They are not as numerous as they once were, but they are still a significant portion of the population. And they remember that promise that God had made to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob that this was to be their land. And so they have regarded all of these successive empires that have come through fighting over this land as usurpers. They regard them as pagans. They feel that it is their birthright to drive these people out. And that's why I said at the time of Jesus, that's what they're looking for. They are looking for a Messiah, a Savior, who is going to come defeat the Romans and establish a new throne, a Davidic dynasty, and make the people, God's people, great among the nations of the earth. That's what they're longing for. And so in the 100 years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, which we're going to talk about in a moment, do you understand that there were over 100 messianic uprisings? That is to say, Jewish people trying to throw off the yoke of oppression that these people had had on them, these successive empires, and in particular, the Romans. Now, if you know anything about Roman history, you know that the Romans are determined to be large and in charge. And they are not going to tolerate this for very long. And furthermore, the Romans, among all these empires, knew how to deal with messianic uprisings with revolutions. You cut off the head and the body dies. So what they would do is they would kill the messiahs. And they did that over and over and over again until finally the Romans said that they had had enough. And what they decided to do... So in the year 70 AD, the Romans have had enough. And they are determined to clamp down hard on these troublesome Jews. And that's exactly what they do. 
the Roman general Titus comes in with multiple legions and they sack the city of Jerusalem. Jesus had actually foretold this on one occasion with his disciples. They were walking through the city of Jerusalem and the disciples said, look at the temple and all of its beautiful stones and monuments. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the time is coming when not one stone will be left standing upon another. And that's exactly what happened in the lifetime of the very men who were hearing Jesus' words. In this year, 70 AD, the Romans came in and they sacked the city of Jerusalem. They raised the temple, destroying temple practices once and for all. They burnt the city and they put, some estimates say, over 100,000 men, women, and children to the sword. So this was, in many ways, a low point in the history of the Jewish people because now it wasn't just that their land was controlled by another, but the whole temple practice of sacrifice by which they would have the covering of sins, it was gone. It was gone. And after the year 70 AD, for about two decades, the Romans began a systematic purge of this land, oppressing the Jews persecuting them, trying to keep them down. And many Jews give in. That is to say, they decide that with the destruction of the temple, there is no longer a place to worship, and there is such persecution that they began to leave this land, this land that had been given to them, and to go to other parts of the Roman Empire where persecution is not nearly as great. So it is a massive scattering and persecution of the people. It's a time of great difficulty. Now the Roman Empire lasted for a long time, but it did not last forever, and it eventually gave rise to the Byzantine Empire. You know that the western part of the empire collapsed. It collapsed in the year 476 AD, and the empire was moved to the east. It was moved to Constantinople, now Istanbul. And when that happened, many of the Christians that were living in Rome, by this point, the Roman Empire had become Christianized. Many of the Christians that were living in the western part of the empire fled the invading tribes and came to the east. And large numbers of them settled in Palestine, in the former Roman province of Palestine. Uh, this was the high point of Christian occupation of the Holy Land. At this point, during the Byzantine period, the primary population of what we call the Holy Land today, Israel, were Christians. All right, that had never happened before, so they are now the dominant force in this area. But unfortunately, as they come in, we see a corresponding, this is one of the sad points in the history of the church, I'm sorry to say, but we see a corresponding rise of anti-Semitism. The Jews have always been an oppressed people. In fact, this past Wednesday, as I was teaching my class on Romans, somebody asked the question, why is that the case? And I gave a twofold answer. One answer is because they are God's chosen people, and in our human hearts we're rebels. We are opposed to the things of God, so we shouldn't be surprised that God's people then should be oppressed. But the other reason is very practical. It's because they're different. And let's be honest, we really don't like people who are different. We are fearful of people who are different. And the Jews were different. They followed different customs. They dressed differently. They had different dietary restrictions. And people thought they were strange, and so they were oppressed. And unfortunately, this was the case during the Byzantine period. Jews, for example, still living there in the Holy Land, those who had remained... Were, not pro were, were prohibited from building houses of worship. So no synagogues were permitted during the Byzantine period. Jews were prohibited from holding public office. They could not be elected, so there was no representative government for them. And they were prohibited from owning slaves. Now you say, well, that's not such a bad thing, except that slavery was part and parcel of the ancient world. And it was normally a sign of influence and power, which tells us that they had none of it. Now, as we had seen in a previous period, there are going to be the rising and the falling of different empires. 
And the Byzantine Empire does not last either. There's going to be empire after empire throughout this region. The Mongols will come in and rule this area for a time. Then the Mamluks. Then the Ottomans will finally arrive. And that's going to bring us up to the current present period. The Ottomans will control this land from 1516. They will come in, drive all the other nations out, and they will control this area for over 400 years. I think most of us in the West are really unfamiliar with the Ottoman Empire, but it was a vast, powerful empire. It ruled over this entire region, 1516 to 1918. During the Ottoman period, I want you to understand there were only 5,000 Jews living in Palestine. So their numbers have diminished greatly. This was the land that had been given to them and to their forefathers, and there are only 5,000 left. We may have more Jews living in Charleston today than they had living in the Holy Land at this point. It was a sad, sad end. Which brings us then to the modern era. The end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and a movement which was known as Zionism. There was an intellectual living in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. He was a lawyer. Uh, he was also a journalist. His name was Theodor Herzl. He, of course, was Jewish, and living in Europe, he had experienced a great deal of anti-Semitism personally, and he had seen this on a widespread level. And he had a heart for his own people, and he had come to the realization that if the Jews were to survive as a people, unique, not just an ethnic group, but a religion as well, then they were going to have to come together because they were so scattered throughout the world that they lived in little communities, little pockets, but they had no influence. And what's more, all of their traditions were in danger of being lost as they were assimilated into Western culture. And so he wrote a book which was entitled Der Judenstaat. It means the Jewish state. And what he basically argued was that Jews, if they were going to survive in the world as a unique people, needed to come together to some place where they could have a land of their own, where they could follow their own customs and make their own laws and be unique without the fear of oppression. And this started the movement known as Zionism. He called on Jews to return to their ancestral homeland, to go back to the old land of Israel. And what is interesting is that over 100,000 did. Mostly Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews from various portions of Europe, they're the primary ones who made the journey back. But remember, there were 5,000 during the Ottomans. Now, 100,000 are moving into this area. The Ottomans, for the most part, have a policy of benign neglect. They're not really worried about this at this point. But hundreds of thousands are now moving back. But then something happens. It's always up and down, you see, for these people. It's always give and take. They had been given now. It was being taken away again. Uh, the Ottomans, during World War I, made the decision to side with the Central Powers. That is to say, the powers that were opposed to the Allies. Uh, Germany, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria. And because Jews in Europe had sided with the Allies during World War I, the Ottomans regarded the Jews as dangerous people living in their midst. In the same way, I might add, that we regarded Japanese citizens living during World War II, who perhaps had been living here for generations, but we regarded them as a threat, and we paraded them off to camps and work camps and that sort of thing. It's a sad point in our history. Well, this was a sad point in this history as well. So the Ottomans, once again, expelled Jews from this land. See, they come back, they're expelled. They come back, they're expelled. They come back, they are expelled. And that's exactly what happened. But by siding with the central powers, the Ottomans had made a fatal mistake. They sided with the losing powers. Ultimately, Germany, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, they were defeated. 
And the Ottomans were likewise defeated. And this empire, which had existed for over 600 years at the end of World War I, is carved up. It's carved up. It comes to an end. The Turkish Republic is born as a consequence. So it comes to an end. And when it comes to an end, the British are given control of this land. This is the beginning of what becomes known, becomes known as the British Mandate, 1918 to 1948. So we're getting much closer. Look how much history I have covered in this short period of time. <laughs> 1918 to 1948, this is what is known as the British Mandate. Now, in 1918, something very significant happens. There was a very powerful Zionist working in Britain at this time, and it was the second Baron Rothschild. Now, you know that name. That is one of the great banking families of Europe. They had basically bankrolled the British war effort, and Rothschild wanted to see his people restored to their land. During the British mandate, the British are open to Jews coming back. And so while they've been expelled by the Ottomans, they start coming back during the mandate. And Rothschild works with the foreign secretary, Lord James Balfour, and Balfour works with the government, and finally they issue a statement. It becomes known as the Balfour Declaration, which declares that it is the policy of the British nation that the Jews deserve a rightful land and state of their own. Now you understand, no nation for thousands of years had ever said that the Jews deserved a place, a nation, a state of their own. The British were the first to do that. Now, there are two important facets of the Balfour Declaration that we can't forget because everybody makes much ado about the Balfour Declaration, and they should because it is significant for what we're dealing with today. But there are two things to remember about the Balfour Declaration. One, it said that there should be a Jewish state in Palestine. The Balfour Declaration did not say the Jewish state should be Palestine. It should be within Palestine, that is within the borders. And the second thing was this, that Jewish state had an obligation. You can read the Balfour Declaration for yourself. That Jewish state had the obligation to respect the rights of the Arab people presently occupying the land. So that's the Balfour Declaration, 1918. Now, hundreds of thousands of Jews begin to flock into this region. And as they come in, they are different tensions rise between these people who are coming in and the people who, quite frankly, had been living in that land for generations. So tensions rise. This is a difficult place. Now, the British had great success in governing very difficult parts of the world. They were experts on this. But even they came to the end of their patience. Finally, the British said, we're done. <laughs> we're, we're, we're done with this. We, we cannot contain this tension and, and the constant fighting that is taking place between these two peoples. And so in 1947, after World War II, the British say, we're handing what they called the Palestinian problem over to the United Nations. Because after all, they've got the answer to everything, don't they? <laughs> well, the United Nations at this point was only two years old. And they had no idea what to do with this situation. So they came up with a plan loosely based upon the Balfour Declaration. And it's known as the two-state solution. A two-state solution. What the United Nations proposed in 1948 was that they would have a nation state for the Jews, their own sovereign country and state, and the Arabs would have their own nation state and country. And it was put to a vote. And the Arabs rejected it out of hand. Now you say, well, shame on them. Well, there are a couple of things. As I said, the situation is complex. It is difficult. 
you have to remember that the Arab people that were living in that land had been living there for generations. Now, you might think, well, the Jews have been promised that land by God. Yes, nobody's disputing that. But I want you to imagine living in Charleston, and all of the sudden, you remember, you whites were not the first people here. There were Native Americans living here, and they were driven out. Well, just imagine that they reach a critical mass, they decide they come back, and the government supports them, and they say to you, living on Murray Boulevard, or down there on South Battery, you need to move out because this land originally belonged to another people. How would you feel about that? You probably wouldn't feel really good about it. And these people did not feel good about it either. In part because when the UN carved up the land, they gave 62% of it and the most fertile regions of it to the Jews. In spite of the fact that the Arab people who lived in the land were twice the number in population. So to them, it certainly didn't seem fair. That's one reason they rejected it. The other reason they rejected it is because they felt that it was their land and this new people coming in had no right to possess it. And so they swore to the destruction of a new two-state solution. Well, May 14th, 1948 is a red-letter date, not only in the history of this region, but of the world. On May 14th, 1948, the British mandate came to an end. The British hauled down the Union Jack, sang God Save the King, and left. On the same day, however, Israel declared her independence as a separate state, according to the lines set forth under the UN resolution. She declared herself a new nation. And on that same day, the most powerful nation in the wake of World War II recognized Israel as a sovereign state among the nations of the earth. The United States, President Harry Truman was the first nation to recognize Israel. In the wake of the Holocaust, all of Europe was of the mind that the Jews were entitled to a nation and a state of their own so that it would never, ever, ever happen again. And so in 1948, the nation of Israel was born. You can see the map there on your right. Now, we don't have time to go into this, but there was a group of people that were opposed to this, and they became organized. They would eventually become known as the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. It was created in 1964. It would declare its independence in 1988. But... The point that you need to remember is that Jews are now back in the land in great numbers, having come in during the British mandate. They have now been given a nation, a state, within the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob thousands of years before. It's really an extraordinary turn of events. Now, there's an old hymn that goes like this, Zion stands by hills surrounded, Zion kept by power divine. All her foes shall be confounded, though the world in arms combine. Well, that's an apt description of Israel's history. Zion stands by hills surrounded. From the moment of her birth, she was opposed by all of the Arab nations around her. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. They all were opposed to the existence of Israel as a state, and from the beginning, they all swore to the destruction of Israel. Now, we don't have time to go through all of the conflicts because it has been continuous, continuous. But let me just highlight a few of the significant wars that Israel has fought. She was only born in 1948, folks. We haven't fought this many wars, and we were born in 1776. There was the 1948 Arab-Israeli War when all of those nations, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, they all attacked Israel, trying to wipe her off the face of the earth. There was the Six-Day War in June of 1967. That involved Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, EJS, that you see up there on the screen. The significant thing about 1967, as, as it pertains to what's going on today, is that in that war, Israel dominated... And she took back areas, or she took areas, I shouldn't say took back, she took areas that had previously been controlled by the Arabs. Namely, 
the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. And these, of course, are exactly what we're dealing with. So Israel seizes those in 1967 and has never given them back. All right. 1973, you have the Yom Kippur War between Egypt, Syria, and Israel. It's an attempt to regain those lost territories of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And Israel is once again successful. There is the 1982 Lebanon War in which Israel invades Lebanon to expel the PLO. Then there's the first Intifada, 1987 to 1993. That means an uprising, an uprising on the part of the Palestinian people. Again, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, the second Intifada, 2000 to 2005, the Lebanon War against Hezbollah in 2006, the Gaza War against Hamas, 2008-2009, the Gaza War against Hamas, 2012-2014, Israeli-Palestinian crisis in 2021, where Hamas makes rocket attacks against Jerusalem and the development of the Iron Dome system, and then you have the present crisis, the issue with Hamas today, the Sunni branch of Islam, and Hezbollah, the Shia branch of Islam. Zion stands by hills surrounded. As the old poem says, the charge of the light brigade, cannons to the right, cannons to the left, a people surrounded by others who want to wipe her off the face of the earth. Now, that's not to say that there haven't been significant strides in recent years. In particular, there have. The Camp David Accords in 1978, which were due, I might say, in large measure to the heroic efforts of President Jimmy Carter. There's much about Carter that I don't agree with, but I will say this much about Jimmy Carter. Um, he has gotten a bad rap when it comes to foreign policy. The Camp David Accords were amazing. And it brought peace between Egypt, President Omar Sadat, and Israel. They'd been sworn enemies. And so the Camp David Accords were signed. So that was a very significant. And you'll notice that Egypt today is not involved in this war. In fact, if they're going to open a humanitarian corridor, it's going to be where? To Egypt. So that was significant. The Oslo Accords between Israel and the PLO. Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1993. Itzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. Significant strides. And then the Israel and Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994, which was due in large measure to King Hussein. So Israel has peace with Egypt now, relative peace. She has peace with the Hasmonean uh, dynasty in Jordan. So there is peace. There have been significant strides, but there are still some continued sticking points. What are those continued sticking points? One, of course, is the two-state solution. The PLO has been recognized, but Hamas and Hezbollah, these extreme groups within Islam, refuse to accept it. They have sworn to the destruction of Israel. So the two-state solution is still a sticking point for some of these people. Settlements in the land gained in the Six-Day War. This is an issue. Again, as I said, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights. The United Nation has declared Israeli settlements in those areas illegal, according to international law. Remember, the Israeli, the, um, Israel had taken that land in 1967 and refused to give it back. Well, the problem was that when they took it, there were people living there. And they have systematically driven those people out and established Jewish settlements in those areas. What has happened to those people? Well, the surrounding countries have refused to take them, and so they have become refugees. They are orphans internationally. They have no citizenship anywhere. You know, when you travel around the world with the United States passport, you have the full force and authority of the United States government behind you to protect you. Israel's doing everything in its power right now to protect and get back its citizens that were taken as captives. These people have no one to represent them. 
They are international orphans. Now, Israel responds to this charge that what they have done is illegal by saying there was no legal owner prior to the possession. The Arabs had rejected the two-state solution, so nobody really owned this land. It was no man's land, and now they have it. Another sticking point is Israeli control of Jerusalem. They took Jerusalem and access to the Temple Mount. As you know, that is a huge issue because there are two very important Islamic sites there. But Israel controls it, and there have been recently attempts for Israel's, uh, Isra Israelis to go there and to be able to worship and so forth, and that has become a huge sticking point. And then, as I said, the refugees, all of the Palestinians living in this land, 5.6 million of them who are the descendants of those who were driven out in 1948. So you can begin to see, oh my goodness, this is a long, complicated history. Now I want to close by simply asking the question, what should our response be as Christians? I know that this is a hot political issue. I know. And there are people that say, well, Israel has every right to defend herself, and yet over on another side of the political spectrum, you have other people that are saying, no, what's going on over there is a humanitarian crisis and Israel's gone too far. What, what are we as Christians to make of this? How, what should our response be? Not as Americans, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, but as Christians, as the followers of Jesus Christ. Well, our first response I would suggest to you is that we need to pray for Israel. We have an obligation. She has every right especially in light of what happened in the 1930s and the 40s. She has every right to be a people and to be a nation. And Israel was created and it is recognized as a nation and we need to pray for these people and the terrible things that they have experienced over the course of the past week. I don't need to go through the catalog of all the heinous crimes that these terrorists have experienced and uh, have perpetrated. And furthermore, as Americans, in the wake of September 11, 2001, we know what terrorism looks like and how difficult it is to combat. And we have a bounden obligation and duty to pray for Israel. But we also have a bounden duty and obligation to pray for the Palestinians. I want you to think about the population in Gaza right now. There's 2.3 to 3 million people living in that land. 68% of the population is under the age of 18. 50% of the population is under the age of 15. The United Nations estimates that there are 500,000 pregnant women in Gaza right now. You know, as Americans, we always want to make it simple. All I want you to tell me is, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Who wears the white hats? Who wears the black hats? That's what I want. It's just not that simple, folks. It is a very complicated situation. And there is going to be untold human suffering as a consequence. final thing I want you to remember is this. Nobody's plate is clean. As I said, we want to know who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. Israel certainly has a right to defend herself. She has a, an obligation to protect her citizens. But we sometimes forget that the other people are people for whom Christ died as well, and he loves them just as he loves the Jews. While the crimes of Hezbollah and Hamas deserve to be punished, and punished to the full extent of the law, we shouldn't forget that Israel also has a biblical mandate. And that biblical mandate in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy is that she is to be kind to the stranger living in her midst. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were once sojourners in the land of Egypt. 
You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were once strangers in the land of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners, strangers, in the land of Egypt. A man once came to Jesus and asked the question, he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And by the way, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus said, well, you know the greatest of the commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this man, in an attempt to justify himself, asked, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus told a parable. A parable about a Jewish man who's on his way to Jerusalem and fell among thieves and was beaten by the side of the road. And along came a priest and saw the wounded man and passed by on the other side. And along came a Levite and saw the wounded man and passed by on the other side. Finally, along came a Samaritan, the sworn enemies of the Jews. And he had compassion on the man, put him on his own animal, took him into town, paid for his wounds to be dressed, had compassion on him, had mercy on him. And Jesus asked the question, you tell me who was neighbor to the man in distress? And the man asking the question replied, I suppose, the one who had mercy on him. Folks, the situation over there is a mess. It's the result of centuries, centuries of warfare, hatred, belligerence. I was sitting at a dinner last night and somebody asked me if there was one thing that you would do to fix the problem in the Middle East. I said, there's nothing anybody can do to fix the problem in the Middle East. It is going to take a divine solution to fix the problem in the Middle East. It will take God taking away hearts of stone and giving to all people, a heart of flesh. And so what should the Christian response be? The psalmist put it best. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. Amen.